Hey guys, real quick, I wanted to let you know before this video starts, I'm recording this the day after, and instead of having to actually record the whole thing over again, I wanted to make a quick caveat and say, yes, this is about test plans, but this is also generally just kind of how I test, you know, how I how I make bugs, how I, you know, see the different parts of the game and, and jam them together to make bugs. So while I say test plan a lot, and this is a video about making test plans, um, it's also just sort of a general, this is how I usually test a game kind of thing. So just wanted to let you guys know that before we start. Thanks. So I've been putting this video off for a little while. So why have I been putting it off for so long is because test plans are such an unbelievably broad thing. They're unbelievably powerful, but they're also kind of the bane of my existence. Some of you who've been with the channel for a while might say, didn't you already kind of do a test plan video? Yeah, I did do one for Saints Row 2's opening mission a while back. It wasn't really a test plan, it was more just mission testing, but they're kind of the same thing in a lot of ways. And I'll be doing the same thing today, because honestly, that's the easiest way to show how I make test plans, is to just sort of walk you through it. Now, sometimes you'll hear people talk about things like ad hoc testing versus test plan testing, and I do that too sometimes. But really, these two are kind of interconnected in a lot of ways. They don't have to stand in opposition to each other, even though sometimes they really do. So let me go over a few basics and caveats real quick, and then we'll jump right in and actually make one on camera. That way you can see how I create them. All right, it's time for my regular QA bootcamp disclaimers. QA in the game industry is not very well standardized, at least not to my knowledge. So everything that I'm going to teach you is mostly self-taught and self-developed. And it might not work this way in whatever QA department you wind up in. In fact, some places don't use test plans at all, like the place I work right now actually does not use test plans, which is kind of mind-blowing, but eh, I make my own, and I'm going to show you how to. And also, this was all self-developed. I'm sure there's better ways to do this. There might be, there might not be, but this is a way that I have found that I developed test plans, and I'm sure it's very flawed, but we're going to jump into it anyway. All right, so what exactly is a test plan? Usually it's just a list of tasks, usually in a spreadsheet, that you check off saying, yes, this has been done, uh, and this was whether it was a pass or fail, and here's the link, and any additional notes. So it seems kind of like you've written a bug before you've written a bug, uh, is kind of what a test plan is, but it's sort of just a cursory, all right, here's what I think might cause a bug. Here's what's something that could potentially cause a bug, and we've checked it. I've seen some be incredibly vague, like mission one, checkbox, pass or fail. But I've also seen it go much the other way, where it's unbelievably detailed. Sometimes they'll have things like equip the pistol and this jacket, then roll to the left. Now equip another pistol and the same jacket. Now roll to the left. Like it's, uh, it can get pretty detailed. But they really are bespoke for each studio and usually for each project and sometimes for each team and sometimes even for each person. There's actually a bunch of different factors that can affect how a test plan really ends up. The author of the test plan really should know the game in and out pretty well. It's also going to depend on how long the game has actually been in the hands of QA. So if it's only been in the hands of QA for like a week or so, any test plan that they come up with is probably not going to be very detailed. Also, the state of the game itself matters as well. There's times that QA will get their hands on a build and, let's say, vehicles are not open to bugging yet, or combat is not open to bugging yet. So those are the kind of things that can really throw a monkey wrench into making a test plan. Okay, just a few more things, and I promise we'll jump right into my method of creating the test plan. First off, this is going to be the test plan of an insane person, okay? I have been in this industry for... How long have I been in this industry? My god. Oh God, how long has it been? God, I think it must be 17 or 18 years now. I can't remember. It was whenever the X, it was shortly before the Xbox 360 launched, and I don't feel like looking it up. I think that was 2005. Ah, uh, yes, I looked it up. November 22nd, 2005. Yes, so that is whenever I started in the game industry. God, it's all blurry and bleached together after a while. And with my ADD, any job that can keep me happy for this long, heck yeah. And also, as mentioned before, this is a mission test plan. So if you're testing art or, you know, maybe even activities or basically anything else, your test plan might end up looking quite a bit different than this. And I'm aware that things might get a little confusing and convoluted in this video, but I'm just trying to condense my method into a short bite-sized package. Just give me a shout. I promise no matter where, if I have the ability and the time, I will answer your question, whatever it may be. 
Okay, so I made this quick infographic. It's not a big deal. Um, it's probably full of typos and errors. I typed it out as quick as I could, and it's definitely not what I would call complete. I just tried to make something quick and succinct that you guys could use as a cheat sheet. But let's go ahead and start with step number one. Play through the mission. This is kind of obvious, but you want to have a good understanding of how the mission is supposed to work. So you'll want to work with somebody else on the team, hopefully, that has a good understanding of how the design is laid out for it. And hopefully they can confirm with you how it's actually supposed to work. Because if you don't know how it's supposed to work, it's going to be hard to tell what's broken. Zoom in and zoom out. Now here's where you'll break down the mission to smaller components, be it objectives, checkpoints, characters, etc. Uh, but here you can also zoom out to test broader functions. So this is like the menus that affect almost everything in the game. It might affect just this mission, this one particular setting in the game menu. Other game settings, OS things, game saves, uh, there's a lot of different things that could affect as far as the zoom out. But for today, we're actually just going to focus on zooming in. Now you might want to make a different test plan for different methods of chopping up a mission, but we'll get to that here in just a moment. So here you have to test this whole mission, right? How do you even start? Well, let's just go ahead and break it down to its components. We're going to use objectives. Okay, so let's say we have three objectives. Let's go ahead and break it down even further. Within this objective, let's say there is something where I'm supposed to steal a car and then I'm supposed to take the car to a shop. All right, so I've got these two hash marks. All right, what is the, let's go and break this down further. I have to steal this car and get it to the shop. Those are the two things, uh, checkpoints within the objective. So what do I have even lower? I've got the car. I've got the player character. I probably got other cars. I basically point to each one of these and take note of it. Let's say we have to take it to the shop. What is the shop? I still count the car again because uh, what I do with it in this step might not break anything, but what I might do with it in this step might totally break things. So anything that would apply to this one, we also move over here as well. So I think it was like NPCs, player character, blah, blah, blah. But basically you want to do this for every single objective. You want to break it down as much as you care to break it down. You can break it down really small. You can keep it nice and broad, but I'll demonstrate what I mean whenever we get into it. All right, so this is Red Faction Gorilla. I am not doing the tutorial level. Um, that is pretty basic. I guess I could to keep this video short, but why would I make things nice and simple? I'm gonna go and play through it real quick, uh, and then I will let you guys know what I find out. I'll stop at each uh, objective, or each uh, thing that I wanna segment up. Okay, so here we are in objective number one. Uh, Better Red Than Dead is the name of the mission, and destroy the abandoned base. So here's our spreadsheet. I went ahead and decided to use uh, Google Sheets just because that's freely available to everybody. I uh, usually use Microsoft Excel, but that's just because that's what I've been using forever. And so if I use any weird terminology or wrong terms, I apologize. So, better red than dead. And also, this is going to be unbelievably disorganized uh, at first. Your best bet is to kind of just get all the components out and then sort of focus on getting it better later. So this is pretty much what you'd be doing in your step one. Actually, step one, you probably play through it completely first. Uh, but step two is play through it again and then gather however you're going to segment it. For us, we're going to use objectives. So let's go and play through it again. Let's play through it. Okay, so our next objective is get back to the safe house. Simple enough. Let's go ahead and move that over. Get. I got I got a new keyboard, so it's messing with me. Sorry. <laughs> Get back to the safe house. I think that's what they said. Yeah. Yeah, get back to the safe house. Sorry. Okay, so we got our two objectives. We got objective one, objective two. Pretty simple mission overall. All right, so let's go ahead and say what the... Uh, oh yeah, let's do our next test, I guess. Gather, go ahead and gather our, our entities. Um, all right, so we got our player character and since uh, that's going to be in the same one Or same that's going to be something that carries over from objective to objective. We got that. Uh, what do we just we have we have the uh, EDF show up, but they don't show up until objective two. Well, actually they could be out and about but that might be a, a different That's not less of an entity more of an agent of chaos, but we'll get to that later. So uh, the scripted EDF Scripted Okay, so I went ahead and cleaned this up a little bit, but uh, just so you know, any test plan you make, it can be completely different looking depending on what you're doing. So let's go ahead and, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll let you know if you wanted to make a, one that looks completely different, please, by all means, you're not doing it wrong or doing it right. Whatever works for you works best. 
Okay, so this is being super basic with our entities, but I could sit here and try and find a bunch more, but I don't want to do that. I want to go ahead and get back into the meat of the actually creation of it. Full disclosure, I did work on Red Faction Guerrilla, so I do have some intimate understanding with how it works. But, that being said, um, back in the day, you used to actually be able to get the EDF scripted to show up earlier than what they're supposed to, the objective to. They actually kind of just showed up whenever you got to the base. Um, and I actually, I broke this mission by frequently getting the EDF to show up and then them be the ones to blow up the base and actually destroy it. But yeah, for some reason, the EDF blowing up the base, the game was just listening for if the base had been destroyed by the player. It wasn't listening for just if the base had been destroyed. Okay, so next step is to gather our Agents of Chaos. What would those be in this instance? In Red Faction Guerrilla, what would those be for us? You notice I removed the uh, Agents of Chaos uh, thing here. It was all the way to the right eventually, or initially. Um, what I try to do is I try to keep the Agents of Chaos a little bit separate. So we're going to go down here and we're going to say the Agents of Chaos. And we're going to list them here. NPCs. EDF. Uh, ambient. We're going to make sure to put ambient there because they're not the ones that are scripted by the mission. They weren't scripted by, they weren't created, they weren't spawned using the mission script. They were just spawned because the EDF spawned naturally in the world. Vehicles, which uh, a lot of times people lump those in with NPCs, but I don't. I think they usually have wildly different uh, AIs running at a particular time. So for me, they are a completely different thing. I switched this up a little bit too, just to better represent exactly what it is we're saying we're doing with it. Don't worry, we'll get there. Okay, so I went ahead and changed this uh, label real quick just to be optional modifier to better sort of label exactly what I'm doing with it. Okay, I'm sure I could gather more Agents of Chaos, but I probably don't need to for the sake of this video, but let's go ahead and keep moving. The last thing is, the best part of the whole friggin' thing is get creative, man. Uh, let me see, you've made up your list, now's the fun part. Get started, get inventive, jam those various components together in every way you can think of, and make things break. Okay, so now that we've got these together, let's say, what are the different things that I can do with my player character? Let's go ahead and add in a few more lines here. All right, so what can the player character do? They can die. They can leave the mission area. Kill a bunch of NPCs. And that would be one of our modifiers. So if you're ever coming up with ideas, so like, I, I say I don't have any other ideas other than die, leave mission area, and kill a bunch of NPCs uh, for the player character. I can't think of any other test to do with the player character during this objective. So, all right, so let's say, all right, die. There's a lot of different ways to die. So I changed the top one to die via fall damage. Um, and let's say, look at our Agents of Chaos. Uh, EDF amb Ambient. Sure, let's look at our player character. Let's cross-reference them. What can I do with my player character and EDF Ambient? Uh, I could die by the EDF. And went ahead and changed this to leave playable area because leaving mission area is probably a completely different failure state for the mission uh, than just dying. All right, I've got die via pit. There's pits in the game. I can add that to my Agents of Chaos. Uh, abyss. How do you spell abyss? How do you spell abyss? I'm a terrible speller. Oh, yeah, I, I am a terrible speller in grammar. That's why I always constantly preach proofread, 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 because uh, <laughs> if I ever write something right on the very first try, it's probably pure dumb luck or the fact that I've probably written that exact same bug in some way, shape, or form a thousand times. And obviously some of these things can fit into different categories. So the playable area could be its own mission entity and you can find different things to do with that. So you can leave it up here if you want, but I am gonna put this right here, sort of cross-reference it. And I went ahead and printed this up a little bit, gives ourselves a section for notes, a uh, link to a bug in case there is one and made a bunch of uh, conditional formatting for pass fail, so. Okay, so I went ahead and just highlighted all these row rows and made it to more actions and then group rows. That way I can just kind of keep this nice and tidy and collapse it. So let's say fall damage acted normally. Pass. Perfect. Uh, let's say dying via ambient uh, EDF failed. Let's say, and you'd say exactly what happened. You'd want to give more details. On a pass, pass. On a pass, you probably don't need to add any details really here. Um, unless you feel like there's something that still needs to be said. Sometimes there is. Uh, but uh, as far as the fail goes, you probably want to add a few notes as to exactly what happened, even if it's something that just you want to come back later for. And then here's where you'll put a link to the bug after you've posted it. Now, sometimes some people have a last date tested. 
Um, I don't usually have that, but it can be very handy sometimes to know that, all right, this test has was done, which is great, um, but we don't know when it was done last. So maybe it was something whenever the mission was completely different and it needs to be tested again. Okay, so we're still on our player stuff uh, here. So I don't think we have anything else. Is there anything that our players can interact with the NPCs? Um, kill a bunch of NPCs, that's right. Uh, let's see, NPCs, um, killed by, by, oops. Killed by hostile NPCs. Let's see, what else? We got EDF ambient, we still got something up there. I don't know, there's probably some other EDF ambient stuff that we could look into, but again, I don't want to get too crazy here. This is a test plan and you're already probably starting to see how insane test plans can get. Every single little idea you can think of usually can be applied in more than one place. That's why I keep the Agents of Chaos separately. Because with the Agents of Chaos, you can apply them usually to every single objective. Now that leads me to another point. There's a lot of tests that would apply to every mission, not just every objective. So player death is one of those things. Or being killed by ambient EDF. Let's say that's one, for instance. So if I think of one test that I can do in any mission, or just at least a lot of missions, I put it separately, usually in a separate tab. Like, I'll make a completely different tab for them, and then sort of copy and paste them over to the uh, mission tabs. But if thinking of just that one idea causes your test plan to balloon quite a bit, because then you can try it in every single mission, and then, yeah. But let's keep going on a few more examples real quick, just so I hopefully have a good idea of what I'm actually telling you guys. Hopefully it's not too confusing. Hopefully I've done a decent job of this. This is my second attempt trying to make this video and I'm really hoping that it's the last, but eh, if it, I don't like how it turns out, I'll probably either post it and then make a new one later or just not post it and make a new one later. I'm rambling. Okay, so let's take a look at our abandoned base just to be sure. Hey, another agent of chaos, vehicles. Player controlled vehicles. Player vehicles. Now I've come up with another variable to add to all of these, so I can go down the list. All right, player character. What can I add player in a vehicle? Oh, I wonder if I could kill myself with my own vehicle. Oh, maybe I can also. So I can now say, what happens if I leave the um, playable area in a vehicle? Will it blow up? Will it cause problems that way? I've had times where you have, and this is not a joke, uh, and Saints Row 1, I think is what it was, uh, our streaming system can get a little funky sometimes where if you were in a vehicle, drove it into the water that was out of the mission play area and that timer that says, hey, you better get back to the mission play area uh, ran out, you would fail the mission, but then warp back to the mission start while still in the driving position and you wouldn't be able to move. So that sounds really, really weird, but it's gonna happen to somebody. All right, so how else can we use player vehicles? I come up here, what if I found a way to destroy the abandoned base with the player vehicle? What if I found a way to do it with NPC vehicles? What if I found a way to make NPCs destroy the abandoned base? I don't know why I said that like uh, Jerry Seinfeld, but we're, we'll roll with it. But yeah, uh, basically every time you sit and think of a new agent of chaos or a new entity, you can usually come up with basically a multitude of, of tests by sort of taking that component and then jamming it into all the other components and seeing how you can make them interact. But that's really the long and short of how I personally make test plans. Uh, I'm sure it's not perfect. Obviously it's very ugly right here. Uh, I promise whenever I have it finished, it's usually much prettier looking, much easier to read. Um, but really this is the crux of it. It, it looks confusing. Um, we'll go ahead and uh, step through objective two just to see if there's anything we can think of there. Uh, let's say the EDF scripted. What if I killed by, what the player's killed by those EDF scripted? So we can do that right now. We would put that up here. Insert one above. Uh, let's see, modifier. Oh yeah, we need to say what the test description. I kind of missed those. Um, so all right, abandoned base. Uh, get NPCs to destroy the base. Um, destroying the abandoned base with a player vehicle. Getting NPCs to drive their vehicle into base. So instead of typing this all, all out again for the second objective, uh, I would recommend just uh, copying 
everything from the first objective. Okay, so I just went ahead and copy pasted all the stuff to the second objective. And some of it's obviously not going to uh, apply. So like the abandoned base is no longer a thing um, in objective two. In fact, that's what caused objective two to trigger. Something to note, by the way, is knowing what entity will cause the, uh, the what script trigger will cause it to move to the next objective is very important information to have. That's why I say it's always important to list them out, uh, play through the mission, make sure you understand it well uh, before you go about breaking it. But as you can see, this is why I've been putting this video off for so long. It is, it seems super duper uh, complicated and, and it can be depending on how complicated you want to make it. Test plans can be unbelievably powerful. They can be unbelievably frustrating. Okay, so let's go ahead and test a few of those things or one of those things real quick to see if we can't figure out if whether it fails or not is irrelevant. It's about whether you actually do the test and knowing whether it get marked, got marked off. Probably the simplest of one is going to be to just get outside of the mission area. That'll be our, our probably our simplest, easiest, fastest, not going to break anything, probably, uh, test. But that's not the point. The point is that it needs to be tested. That it doesn't matter whether it fa passed or failed. Having that checkpoint and say, it says failed. All right, that's what we expect. Now, if I hit continue and something breaks, then that's a problem. Hopefully just puts us right back to the beginning or to our most current objective or checkpoint. There we go. That seemed to work. Uh, it took me out of the mission, uh, but you know, that's within the realm of uh, design. So that's pretty much it for that. But that's pretty much how I make a test plan. Um, the long and short of it. There's a lot more details to it that I'm sure would bore you because I'm sure this bored you. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much how it works. There are a few other items that I feel like you all should know real quick before I say goodbye. So one thing I definitely want to let you guys know is when I was talking about zooming in, uh, that means breaking down the mission into its basic components and trying to break it down as much as you can, as small as you can, or as small, small as you want to, really, because you can break it down to be pretty dang small and infinitesimal if you want, but you're going to drive yourself insane if you do that. But I also mentioned zooming out. So what I mean by that is instead of just looking at the mission and breaking it down to its components, you can actually zoom out and say, all right, how can I affect this mission with things that aren't necessarily uh, part of the mission scripting or part of even the game scripting. So what I mean by that is like say menus, pause menus, saving and loading, uh, you know, audio settings, uh, various things like that. And you can even go even bigger. You can zoom out even further and say, all right, let's take a look at the uh, OS things. Uh, there's various test kits that let you do latency mode. You can do no internet. You can do uh, a test to say when the hard drive is full. You can do a test whenever there's no account present. Um, you can do an account uh, thing where an account signs in and out. There's a lot of different things you can do in the OS. And surely you think, I can't go out further, could I? Absolutely, you can zoom out even further. Let's start looking at hardware stuff. Uh, Ethernet cable pulls, uh, even pulling the HDMI cable, pulling a controller in and out, you know, disconnecting the controller. Um, there's a lot of different things that you can do by zooming out, so don't feel like you always have to zoom in. Don't look always at the smaller, try to look at the whole picture every now and then as well. All right, so I know that was a lot to get through, guys. I'm sorry, I'm sure I created more questions than I did answers, and I apologize for that. So hopefully this is, uh, by the time I'm done editing it, will make something resembling sense. I did want to take the time to make this video because I've given the impression that I somehow hate test plans sometimes, and I don't. I really don't. Um, I just don't like it whenever I have to run through somebody else's test plans, but that's just me. Now, if I don't like test plans as much, why do I even bother making them? Well, there's actually a lot of great reasons why I still make test plans. One, I can actually think of tests a heck of a lot faster than I can perform them. So a lot of times if I thought of a test, I can just write it out in a test plan really fast and then come back to it later. It does really help you stay organized like this and I highly recommend anybody do it. It's not fun. It's not a fun aspect of the job, but it's definitely what I like to call in the category of eating your vegetables. Not every job is going to be fun all the time. And honestly, it does feel kind of good to come up with all these fun tests and to look it over after you've done and be like, man, look at all those insane tests that I came up with. That can be kind of gratifying. It's also nice to sort of get this nebulous gnawing fear out of your head. What I mean by that is sometimes you just don't know. You think there's got to be a bug hiding around every corner. There's got to be this thing I haven't tried. But once you've written it out, it actually helps you take that sort of stress out of your mind a little bit. And when I say a little bit, I mean it does alleviate it a lot the more you do it, but it'll never be fully gone. As a QA tester for many, many years, I know there's always a bug around another corner. 
And also, don't be so strict to it, like I said before, make the test plan that works for you. I made this whole process up, and you should make up your own too if you feel like you can come up with a better one. Please do. But really, I honestly think probably one of the more important aspects of making test plans is it helps people see the test plan and know what has been tested. There's no longer this thing of like, hey, the single player is buggy, or hey, I wonder if mission eight is buggy. You've got a long laundry list of things that you actually tried that production and design and programming and audio and everybody can point to and say, all right, yeah, this has had eyes on it. Maybe, and you know, like I said before, some people like to add the whole uh, last date tested. Maybe it hasn't been for, you know, a few months, but we know that it has been looked at. And what that really helps out with is sort of calling the demon by its name. Um, by saying the test and saying that it's been done, you kind of take a little bit of the power and stress out of it. But this was a super long video and I'm sure very um, trying for everybody to watch. But hey, if you guys have any questions whatsoever, please reach out. Um, we started the Discord just a little while ago and it's uh, growing quickly. Uh, and I thank everybody for coming to, uh, to join it. And uh, it, it, it's actually really motivated me to try and create more things. So I thank you all for uh, your support and everything like that. I know this is kind of a, a I know this is a little more touchy feely than you're used to hearing from me, but uh, I just wanted to say thank you very much. I really do appreciate it. And uh, I'll see you in the next one. Bye.